In a 2010 special issue of Asian American Studies journal, Amerasia, on transnational connections between Asians in Australia and the U.S., Ian Ong describes the often contradictory and always strategic position that Australia occupies with respect to the East-West binary as, quote, sometimes already part of Asia, at other times not at all, end quote, a position that she predicts, quote, may well be the future or may well be the fate of many Western societies in years to come. On the one hand, Australia is geographically closer to and economically dependent on its northern neighbors. According to the Australian Government Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australia's total trade with China in 2010 was $105 billion, almost 24% 24 more than in the previous year, and the first time that Australia's two-way trade with a single nation had topped $100 billion. In 2011, China continued to be the leading trade partner, followed by Japan, the U.S., and South Korea in that order, with the majority of the top 10 export and import markets located in the Asia-Pacific. Despite its economic ties to the region, however, Australia continues to align itself culturally and politically with the UK and increasingly the United States. This emotional disconnect, or what Ong calls distant proximity, suggests that um, sort of implied white Australians <clears throat> feel toward Asia for, um, seems to be echoed in the disproportionately low number of images and stories about people of Asian descent in Australian media outside of SBS and ABC on network television and Asian Australian films such as Floating Life, The Finished People, and The Home Sung Stories on the big screen. Most of these films, like their Asian American counterparts, get limited distribution, if any, due to their culturally specific content and the high level of competition for government funding in a small local industry dominated by Hollywood content. And here, Olivia Ku, Audrey Yu, and Belinda Smell are doing great work talking about this particular group of films. Given this, the commercial and critical success in 2009 of Mao's Last Dancer, I wonder how many of you here have actually seen this I've film. I've heard of it. Like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll show you some clips. <laughs> um, a biopic based on the memoirs of former ballet dancer and Chinese-Australian Li Sun Shin. I also want to say my Chinese pronunciation is atrocious, so please bear with me. Um, seems quite remarkable. The picture, directed by Bruce Beresford, best known for Breaker Moran and Driving Miss Daisy, made 15 million at the box office to become the top grossing domestic film of the year, followed closely by Baz Luhrmann's Australia. Centering on a Chinese international student who defects to the US in the 1980s, the film is directed, adapted, and choreographed by Australians, shot in China, Australia, and the US, and performed by a multinational cast for a global audience. As such, it presents itself as an interesting case study for thinking about the relationship between China and Australia as mediated through the specter of the U.S. and asymmetrical relation to power in the Asia-Pacific more generally at the level of cross-cultural representation and performance, which are two of my uh, big research interests. So in my presentation today, I want to focus on the transnational translations of the figure of Li Swinshin, Chinese, American, Australian, dancer turned stockbroker by the Australian film production crew, by Chinese and Chinese diasporic audiences, and by Lee himself. In particular, I want to consider the notion of adaptation as aesthetic and cultural translation in two connected ways. I'll begin by looking at how an Australian film crew literally adapted Lee's memoirs from the script to casting um, and set production, and attempted to make the film culturally, emotionally, and aesthetically authentic, which is a word that comes up over and over again, to Lee's experience, um, to its predominantly Western target audience. Then, drawing on, respe on responses to Mao's Last Dancer among Chinese and Chinese diasporic viewers online, I'll go on to consider how this fiction of authenticity is enabled by and continuous with the blatant inauthenticity that characterizes Lee's diasporic mode of entrepreneurial self-adaptation. Here, I mean his ability to cross-market himself across cultural, national, and generational boundaries by performing the roles expected of him by various groups and audiences, a performance viewed with suspicion by some as selling out and celebrated by others as the attainment of a kind of universalism. So I'll end by asking, and it, it's a huge question that I can't answer, but I'll ask how we might interpret this figure 
within the paradigm of a decolonizing and de-imperializing Asia-Pacific studies, and how examining similar figures and the decontextualized American dreams that they activate in popular audiences around the world might reorient not only American, but also, perhaps more importantly, Australian and inter-Asian cultural studies. <clears throat> Art, freedom, authenticity. Australian reviewer Mike Walsh describes the off-screen position of Australia in the film as a kind of mediating third space. He writes, quote, Australia is the unseen endpoint in the narrative, the place of calm outside the action, the place from which reflection is now possible. It is also a point from which both the U.S. and China can be criticized with varying degrees of severity. China, of course, gets the worst of it, end quote. Walsh points to the grainy, dull green filter that permeates the scenes of Lee's childhood, as well as constant references to the lack of creativity and individuality in China due to its totalitarian communist government. In contrast, America is painted in broad strokes as a place of excessive consumerism, but political freedom, where Lee's artistic abilities can flourish and subsequently his subjectivity can emerge. According to director Beresford in here, um, oh, it was before, but anyway, it's not important. Everybody in the film crew talks about how this film is so universal, that it's got a universal narrative, and that narrative is the extreme rags to riches story. So this poor peasant boy from Maoist China, who through some luck, but really a lot of hard work and sheer will, becomes an internationally acclaimed ballet dancer. Um, the narrative is conveyed through the universal language um, of melodrama in flashback scenes to Lee's poverty-stricken past and in spectacular action scenes, which consist of visually and viscerally stunning dance performances. And here, I mean, this, I was just getting some quotes about adaptation from Sardi and Scott. Um, clearly, you know, the audience here is, um, the target audience is English-speaking, um, and this explains why, whereas the, film, uh, the book is very long, big, and it's very linear, he, the film goes back and forth. So it's a kind of dual temporal kind of structure. Um, <clears throat> so while the film was not officially a co-production, Chinese crew were brought in to help with the flashback scenes, including producer, again, I apologize for my pronunciation, Gang Li, first assistant director Zhang Jin Fan, who's worked with Ang Li, Zhang Yimou, and Chen Kai Ga, and casting director Li Hai Bin, who has worked with Quentin Tarantino. The scenes were filmed in five weeks in a mountain village, two and a half hours outside Beijing, as the mud huts in Li's original hometown had been demolished to make way for new Hong Kong-style apartments. DP Peter James deliberately used only 50% negative to shoot the scenes in China so that they would look old and grainy. Location shooting was difficult and dangerous, as the government refused to give Scott a permit at the last minute, but she decided at great risk to shoot anyway. Meanwhile, on the dance end, internationally renowned Australian choreographer Graham Murphy was recruited to choreograph the dance sequences, and actual dancers were cast rather than actors in most of the roles, including Lee as adolescent and adult, both characters played by dancers who, like Lee, graduated from the Beijing Dance Academy and went abroad to study. Um, uh, so Chi, Chi Kao, who plays adult Lee, is the principal at the Birmingham Royal Ballet, and Chang Wu Guo, who plays the teenager Lee, dances in the Australian Ballet. Amanda Shaw and Cam Camilla Vergadis, who play Liz and Mary, respectively, are also professional dancers, and Vergadis is a former student of the woman she plays. So imagine playing your teacher. The genres foregrounded here, martial arts or action and dance slash drama, historically have been distinctly gendered in the West, with martial arts movies targeted toward men, um, sports movies, martial arts, and dance movies targeted toward women. Here it's interesting to note that the majority of memoirs and fictional autobiographies about Asia in the West, from Wild Swans and the Joy Luck Club to memoirs of a geisha, Jasmine, and Still Life with Rice, also tend to center on and target women. And I found that interesting in terms of the gendering of this protagonist in Mao's Dancer. Both dance and martial arts films, however, focus on the body and its potential, with the choreographed physical performances playing a central role in developing the characters, advancing the plot, and eliciting audience pleasure and identification. As Yung Sai Xing discusses, there are historical reasons for this connection. Chinese theater traditions have had a major influence on the evolution of martial arts movies in Hong Kong, especially since the 30s when the northern style of Peking opera began to be synthesized with the southern style of Cantonese opera. Um, for instance, action choreography incorporates the acrobatic skills of Dragon Tiger Masters, um, the third generation of which includes famous transnational screen actors and choreographers like Jackie Chan, Yun Wu Ping, Sam Mo Hung, etc. 
Um, formal links exist between Chinese opera and martial arts forms as well, especially in the emphasis on actors' physical performances over theme, characterization, and plot development in the Western sense. Again, these performances foreground the body, which provides spectacle and create narrative through choreographed movement. According to Yvonne Tasker, dance and martial arts films in the West present, quote, the possibility of men occupying a feminine position that involves being allowed to look at and enjoy an explicit location of the male body on display, end quote. She argues that the quote-unquote feminized position of ostensibly straight men being able to enjoy looking at other beautiful male bodies on screen relies on two things, the transformation of the quote soft masculinity associated with dance to the hard masculinity associated with sport and the oppositional identity activated through this transformation, which represents the working class heroes and by proxy the viewers potential to transcend their marginality. Tasker's reading provides insight into the appeal of martial arts films for Western audiences and how their perceptions of masculinity in these films might get taken up, reworked, and circulated globally. However, as Aaron Anderson points out, it also risks universalizing Western binaries of hard and soft, hard masculinity and soft femininity, and associating these attributes respectively with men and women. While Anderson complicates this binary by drawing on theories of movement from dance studies and the philosophical construct of yin-yang to analyze specific fight sequences, Megan Morris examines the pedagogical training process through which the hero gains the necessary skills to fight. Correct me if I'm wrong, Megan. In particular, she discusses how this process of physical and mental transformation becomes a point of identification for diegetic and extra-diegetic viewers who may occupy identity positions different from the protagonist. The alternative Asian masculinities with which <clears throat> these viewers identify have in common their transcendence, of <clears throat> their transcendence of physical and cultural limits through self-discipline and hard work. Lee seems to embody this hybrid um, westernized Asian masculinity um, when he <clears throat> transcends national, racial, and sexual boundaries through his professional exceptionalism, which is linked inextricably to personal individualism in the film. The individualism gives him equal status with the white characters and superior status over Asian ones who serve as plot devices in the backstory or as symbols of a demonized Chinese um, communist collectivism that stifles the freedom that he and the film come to associate with American capitalist individualism. So in this advertisement that we just saw, <coughs> sorry, Lee Swinchin's desirability as a motivational speaker is built on the authenticity of his experience as someone who has gone from the extreme rags of Maoist China to the riches of the contemporary US and Australia. Here it's interesting also to note the appeal of his simultaneous universality and singularity as the last representative of a bygone era and the nostalgia on the part of both Western and Chinese audiences for the no longer threatening other that this figure might recall. So here, um, uh, somebody pointed this out to me when I gave this paper last. You know, think about the last Mohican, the last samurai, the last action hero. The last emperor. The last emperor, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Movie. Yeah, absolutely. Not a like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the last. Mm -hmm. Yet what I think also makes Li Xunxing so fascinating for audiences is what may be called his inauthenticity, his ability to perform seamlessly so many different kinds of identities and roles, professionally and ideologically, depending on his audience. This may free viewers from feeling the need to identify with him as a Chinese man and instead allow them to al align themselves with the, light liber with the white liberal characters who admire him in the film, or perhaps not to identify with any characters at all, but simply to immerse themselves and enjoy the choreography which many, many critics hailed as the centerpiece of the film. The same fluidity that marks Lee's um, performances on and off stage also characterizes Mao's Last Dancer generically as a film. It can be described and has been described as a ballet film, a chick flick, a family-friendly film, a universal heartwarming melodrama, or as one uh, critic put it, something you could even take your grandmother to. In other words, the film passes in much the same way that Lee does, and in doing so, it upholds the liberal humanist fantasy that underneath even radically different political systems, cultures, and histories, we all think and want the same things. 
As Don Pease, Shelley Fisher Fishkin, and others have discussed, this jives with the notion of American exceptionalism. To sum up then, my suggested preliminary argument is that the appeal of this film and Lee Swinshin lies not just in Lee's self-orientalization or the commodification of his Chineseness, which you know is, is there, I think, to some extent, but also the self-conscious spectacle of Lee consciously and happily selling out. And I don't mean that in a bad way, you know, being strategic, selling his story in so many ways to so many different audiences. What is openly celebrated in this ad, as well as in his memoir and in its film adaptation, is Lee's hybridity, presented as sincere pastiche, the result of the transformative trajectory he has taken from an authentic, objectified, temporarily and spatially trapped subaltern to an inauthentic, active, and self-narrating, and infinitely mobile subject. The charming naivete that Lee exhibits when he first arrives in the US is part of the continuum with the worldly entrepreneur that he has since become. This rags to riches story is embraced by both Chinese and Australian reviewers. In that sense, it no longer seems to constitute a specifically American dream, but rather a pleasurably mistranslated transnational one. Thanks.